Please welcome your moderator, opinion writer for the Washington Post, Michael Gerson. That's me. Um, sorry about that. Uh, our session is Infectious Diseases, Staying One Step Ahead. Um, as the voice of God said, I'm Michael Gerson. Um, I'm at the Washington Post, but I'm also a senior advisor at one bipartisan organization dedicated to the fight against extreme poverty and preventable disease. It says something about our current political situation that for me, a discussion about aggressive microbes, sickness, and infectious threats is actually welcome relief from the news. Um, it's also a discussion that could hardly be more relevant. Um, we're um, seeing how the welcome globalization of markets, culture, and travel involves the unavoidable globalization of threats, including from disease. Um, for a layman like me, uh, it's the insidious creativity of evolution that is so frightening. Uh, we've seen a virus, HIV, that can hide in the body for a decade, constantly shifting its viral shell to avoid detection, spreading silently and killing ten tens of millions slowly. We've seen a virus, Ebola, that kills swiftly and horribly, creating panic and suspicion. Um, it's most likely to threat, to, and it's most likely to spread horribly and unfairly to caregivers. Um, we're seeing a relatively old virus, Zika, spread to new places without immunity, which most people never um, know they have, um, but in some cases may bring terrible suffering to the innocent. And behind it all is the fear of a deadly pandemic flu, which could overwhelm global health systems, deplete commodities, create global panic, and take countless lives. Global health sounds like an abstraction, it is really public health for every American and for vulnerable people around the world. And it would be difficult to assemble a better panel to address these issues. Um, all of them deserve introductions that reflect their foot-long resumes, but I'll be brief to allow more time for us to have a discussion. Um, joining us is Vanina Laurent Ledru, um, who is Associate Vice President at Sanofi Pasteur, one of the world's Leading, advocate, uh, leading vaccination advocates and experts. Pranav Shetty is a global emergency health coordinator for the International Medical Corps, who has responded to some of the world's most uh, difficult crises um, and oversaw Ebola treatment units in Liberia and Sierra Leone. Monsef Slawi um, is chairman of vaccines at GSK who has helped run one of the great health companies and helped develop some of the great vaccines. And Michael Carrilla is the director of the Office of Biodefense Research Affairs and associate director of Biodefense Defense Product Development at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, one of the leading experts on bioterror threats and other emerging infectious diseases. Thank you all for being here. Let me start with a uh, general question for all of you. Um, though it isn't a new virus in the world, most Americans had never heard um, of Zika even four months ago, and now it seems like a worldwide health threat. What are the factors that take a disease like Zika or Ebola and turn it from an epidemic to a pandemic very quickly? And is that velocity increasing? Anyone? So, um, yeah, maybe I'll just start because um, we are now doing some R&D around the Zika uh, vaccine development. But um, taking a step back, um, I think it is also important for us, Sanofi Pasteur, to reflect on what we've learned from Ebola and uh, more generally from the dengue vaccine development that uh, we are now launching. I think the systemic il illnesses and weaknesses that uh, we have seen in the health systems that have allowed uh, Ebola to spread like wildfire still exist, and Zika is very much a sign of this. And uh, I think that we've been able to stop Ebola, not because we've rebuilt um, health systems in West Africa, but also because we have poured massive resources into um, the immediate response and the detection and the education and policies uh, that have allowed the um, Ebola uh, disease to stop now. Um, so I, ge I guess that uh, one short answer to your opening question is that it is indeed very important to build resilient health systems um, that uh, can deal with small clusters of infectious diseases, but these uh, clusters of infectious diseases will continue to happen. 
And I believe that what we can do now is perhaps um, move from a culture of outbreak response, in which we are very much now, to a real culture of prevention. And I'd be happy to comment on this afterwards. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, in terms of why is Zika spreading so quickly now, and uh, are we at risk of seeing this reproduce? The answer for both is, uh, the first one is uh, we don't know. And uh, the second one is we don't know. And the issue is uh, we don't know. No, but that, that's, that's really where the problem is. The problem is around infectious pathogens that have very different modes of transmission, uh, some of which we have had the opportunity to understand, and some of which we haven't. Like Zika, sexual transmi sexually transmitted, was not something that was understood uh, prior to the current uh, spread. <clears throat> so I think the challenge indeed is going to be to realize as, uh, as a society that there are many, many pathogens out there that provoke diseases that we may uh, not understand, the transmission of which may evolve dramatically very quickly, uh, and that indeed we need to be in a state of preparedness that enormously improves vis-a-vis -vis where we are. Today. And again, I'll be happy to comment what, uh, what we've learned for Ebola and, uh, and many other uh, endeavors that GSK has embarked into uh, in that regard. Yeah, and just to build off that, I think, as you mentioned, most Americans had never heard of this disease, although as a scientific community, we've known about this for 60 plus years. Um, and it really shows and or underscores the need for you know, um, what our colleague was just speaking about in terms of prevention, because we don't know what's going to come next. We don't know what's coming down the pipeline. And so we need a kind of all hazards approach to deal with these type of crises as they, as they come up. Um, some of the issues that you mentioned in the beginning, globalization, human migration, animal migration, human, human animal interface, climate change, um, decrease of public health uh, measures in areas especially in Brazil and Latin America that were, that had, um, that were involved in vector control, you know, and things like this, they all play a role in why this is happening now and, and why it's kind of come on the grand stage, as, as it were, you know, in this particular point of time. But, but I think just to underscore what, um, what we've already um, said is that you know, these things are very difficult to predict. We know it's going to happen. We don't know what it's going to be. We don't know where it's going to be or how fast it's going to spread or the specific um, implications on health or public health, but really, you know, at, at a core, we need to address some of those baseline issues around globalization and, and um, health systems um, in order to be prepared as a global community. So I think if we talk uh, generally about uh, infectious disease outbreaks, we can, we can fall back onto a lot of the traditional uh, uh, causes that people cite, which would be increased global mobility, uh, higher population densities uh, throughout the world, encroachment onto uh, uh, natural habitats and coming into contact with things we've never seen before. But I, I think one of the important elements that we need to recognize now going forward is that we have the technology to see everything that's occurring. So I don't think this is something new. I think this has been going on. We just never recognized it before. And quite as, as detailed as we can do right now. And I think if, if we were in a position uh, 20 or 30 years ago where Zika had entered into Brazil, we probably wouldn't have recognized Zika was there. We would have had unexplained microcephaly that would have had people scratching their heads. And if it went away after two or three years, because the population became, actually it became endemic and people get infected with Zika as a child and then get immune and then it isn't a problem anymore, it would have disappeared and we would have not explained it and it would have just been one of those things that have happened. I think we have the ability with our technology to basically see everything happening in real time. And so it's actually prompting then more uh, uh, focused responses and, uh, and quick efforts to try to intervene. The context for a lot of our uh, current discussion is Ebola. Uh, Pranav, you, you were on the front lines of the Ebola crisis. Do you think we're ready for another outbreak of that nature? Um, I, mean, I think that, that's a a difficult question, I guess, and because there's so many nuances and facets about when we talk about preparedness or being ready for the next outbreak and things like this, and there are multiple levels in which we can think about this. So, for example, with Ebola, if we think at the local level and we think about the three most affected countries, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, 
Um, obviously, I think at that stage, we're, we're better prepared in those countries than we, when we were two years ago, obviously, when this came up. Um, there's been a, a lot of investment in training of healthcare workers on infection prevention and control. There's been a lot of work put into the health system in terms of um, making hospitals and health centers places where Ebola is properly taken care of instead of amplifiers of the disease, which we had seen a lot of in the, in the beginning stages. There's been a lot of work put into um, supply chain systems to get um, personal protective equipment to healthcare workers and to those who need it most. Um, and there's been a, a lot of um, investment put into um, community messaging. You know, this is one of, actually this is a huge lesson that we learned as an international community, was that we couldn't ignore the community aspect of, um, of a response to Ebola or any infectious disease threat. And, and kind of the framework has been put in place to help deal with that there. However, we're just talking about three countries. Um, although, you know, albeit some of the most fragile countries, but we have a lot of other countries in the world which are in that state now, which we, we're not paying attention to. So at an international level, I think um, NGOs, such as International Medical Corps that responded, public health agencies such as CDC or Public Health in England got a lot of experience on this. And, and it really was a wake-up call to us that we really don't have the framework in place, the mechanisms in place to deal with this on such a scale you know, that we had seen before. Um, and at a global level, we've seen, and I think a lot of people have read, the criticism that came out against WHO in their handling of the crisis, which has really spurned a, a huge host of reforms at, at that level on um, better governance, better leadership, better coordination, um, recognition of crises um, earlier on. And we can see that now in Zika. Zika very quickly, relatively speaking, became um, deemed a public health emergency of international concern or at least it's linked to microcephaly and Guillain-Barre did, um, which I think is a testament to you know, lessons learned from Ebola and how we need to kind of attack these things quickly. Um, we heard today in, in, in lunch when you were speaking with um, Dr. Frieden about the global health security agenda that had started before Ebola, but we see a lot of renewed interest and, and funding put into it in a number of countries, as you mentioned, getting on board very early in terms of adopting a lot of these resolutions. We have much more financing in place. Obviously, we don't have the funds to respond. We see now the World Bank has a pandemic um, emergency facility fund to respond to pandemics as, as, they, as they come forth. So we still have a ways to go, I think, in terms of are we prepared, um, for example, for the next um, outbreak. But we're, we're closer than we were before, but we still, um, there's still a lot of work to be done. It was interesting when I talked with Ron Klain, who was the White House Ebola coordinator after the crisis had ended, and I asked him what surprised him most. He said, you'd think from the movies that there is a 5,000 person force in hazmat suits to respond immediately to emergencies. And he said, it doesn't exist, um, which is interesting. I, I, Michael, I want to get a feel of what, you, what uh, lessons out of the Ebola crisis that NIH drew. So I think, you know, Ebola was something we had known about for a long time, uh, for, almost, for almost 40 years. And there had been efforts, now limitations in the ability to work with that particular agent because of containment requirements limited the amount of activities that could actually be, be performed at any one time relative to a lot of other, other infectious agents that we have ongoing research programs. But I think probably the most, uh, the biggest lesson I took away from Ebola was a, an appreciation that simply understanding the scientific and microbiological aspects of the agent and the medical aspects of the pathogenesis was insufficient to really make good estimations and modeling of how an outbreak could occur. That is the sociocultural impact of the ability to rapidly spread a disease. And I think that's a, a true gap that we have with many types of infectious agents that there's a, there's a different flavor each agent can have under a different set of conditions that can really change the complexion of the outbreak. We thought we had a handle on filoviruses in general because we had experienced dozens of outbreaks before that usually took place in very low population density, isolated areas, and they ran through a course, and we had sufficient resources to bring to bear to bring that under control. And what we learned from Ebola was that when it be, got beyond a critical point in a region that, was, that had all the right conditions, and there's too many to, to, to enumerate here, uh, that the spread exceeded beyond our capacity to be able to handle that. And that's a potential we have to keep in mind for the future with any outbreak. Can I follow up, Michael, with one point? 
that Vanina made, she said that a lot of what, how that was resolved, the Ebola crisis was resolved, was through a massive intervention rather than systems in place. You know, for, at the most obvious level, there are a lot of places in the world that the 101st Airborne could not go um, in order to respond to something like that. But how, what's your perspective on that? Um, in, in, terms of, in terms of the intervention necessary to bring it to us? Yeah, exactly. I mean, first of all, do we have the, the ability to do that elsewhere other than Liberia? Okay. I, I, think, I, think, I think above any critical level, I think we, 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 reach, a, we, we reach a breaking point in terms of our, our ability. And the, the trick is trying to make sure that we can control, intervene in a crisis early enough and rapidly enough and effectively enough to keep it under that critical mass with which we just run out of resources in terms of personnel, uh, equipment, medical supplies, everything. Yeah. Uh, and that's partly, I would also add, that's partly dependent on the ability of the area in which that's happening to absorb. We, there was a lot of being able to flow uh, personnel and material into the area, but the area itself where that outbreak is occurring has to have an infrastructure to be able to absorb that and take advantage of it. And that, I think, is also a balance that, we, that can vary depending on where the outbreak occurs. Monsef, the um, GSK has talked about the compressed time frame for Ebola vaccine development, but that you'd prefer not to do it that way in the future. Um, how do you do it so, how did you do it so quickly? But also, what can the public sector do to make it less taxing in future outbreaks? Yeah, so let me first say, one, one of the basic learnings from the Ebola crisis and, and Zika, and it's so obvious sometimes we forget it, which is prevention is better than any other form of intervention. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important that uh, public health authorities, uh, the industry, academia, institutions, uh, all stakeholders uh, reintroduce within the armor armoratorium of possibilities and ways to intervene in a case of outbreak to reintroduce uh, the need for prevention, particularly through vaccination. And GSK, as you know, has committed over the past 30 years very significant resources to global health issues, such as the first malaria vaccine or when there was a flu pandemic uh, threat uh, made available new technologies for uh, a pandemic flu vaccine, or when Ebola came to commit to Ebola. What we learned, and, and I'll be happy to describe how, how we went about committing to Ebola, but what we learned is the way we went about it is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. The way we went uh, about it effectively has failed to be a, an effective intervention for this particular outbreak. I think there are now at least two vaccines uh, that have been shown to be immunogenic and safe and probably effective uh, that will be used and could be used for the next outbreak. Um, but we have shown that you know, we've spent enormous resources and we came too late. Uh, and the number one learning we have and that we've been sharing with, with all stakeholders is that we need to be proactive. We can't be reactive. I think a second very important learning is that this cannot be solved by one party or one player. Uh, partnerships are going to be critically important. And among the partners, industry has a very important role to play. Uh, the reason being that it's very important to understand the science and to, for instance, run a clinical trial and publish a paper showing that we're able to protect 100 individuals with a vaccine, it's very different to make a vaccine that is able to be produced into tens or hundreds of millions of doses. Uh, it's the difference between an artisanal vaccine and an industrial technology. Uh, and another important uh, reason for the partnership is that the cost associated with being reactive are very, very large and are of two types. One we can all identify with, which is how much money have we spent, et cetera. 
Another one is much, much harder to quantify. It's the opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. There is no R&D organizations that out there or manufacturing sites available doing nothing and waiting for the next crisis to be there to, to commit all those resources. We stopped doing research on certain vaccines that are, I'm going to call them commercial uh, vaccines, to allocate our resources for the public good, for the vaccine for which there is effectively no market incentive. Otherwise, there would have been a vaccine program ongoing. And that's something that cannot be quantified, but of course we quantify it internally. Mm -hmm. Much, much larger cost than the actual amount of money which we count into hundreds of millions that we allocated actually to doing the project and taking a vaccine. Now we learned some positive things. We learned that we have done in seven to 10 months what we usually did in about 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say part of that, and it's again one of the things that we are really driving with in our discussions with various uh, authorities is we have used a technology for this vaccine that was validated. I call it a platform technology or generic technology. I'm going to explain, I'm going to use a, a parallel to explain it. You can take a car, chassis, and engine that takes a lot of R&D and resources to design, but also to prepare to manufacture at scale in tens of thousands of cars or hundreds of thousands. And you can design it in such a way that you can put different bodies on it. And you end up having quite very different cars. An SUV and a van and a sport coupe. And they actually have 80% underneath that's the same and 20% that's different. When you take vaccine technology, and this is something we've been doing for the past 30 years, this is, we have invested billions of dollars developing this. We've developed what we call platform technologies that are able to induce certain type of immune responses, which is what vaccines do, to help us protect ourselves. And that we have adapted and adjusted to be industrially scalable, so we can make them into hundreds of millions of doses. And that we have shown are safe for use in humans in very large quantities. Those three characteristics take many, many years. This is why it takes 10, 15, 20, it took us 30 years to do a malaria vaccine. Not because we were lazy, it's because we had to uh, establish platform technologies and validate them, et cetera, before we knew they worked. With Ebola, we used the platform technology that we knew worked. And thanks to great support from the other stakeholders, in particular regulators, we were able to literally shunt all the, all, all the steps and in a period of seven months go, and also thanks to great partnership with the NIH, since we, we were collaborating, we went from running primate studies to starting a phase three trial in uh, Liberia. Uh, and we went from having, producing maybe 10 doses of vaccine every, every week to making hundreds of thousands or millions of doses of vaccine. Uh, per, per batch of manufacturing. But as I said, it's not sustainable to do it the way we've done it. Yeah. And honestly, in the case of Ebola, we were lucky. We had the starting point. We actually had already this program in our portfolio of projects. For Zika, we don't. And for the next one, you know, we were all into Ebola. Frankly, Zika was completely, uh, you know, I, I learned about it when I was studying a long, long time ago, and that's it. Uh, now it's on everybody's mind, but I can't tell you what's the next pathogen right. and the next one and the next one. Uh, but what, what we know is that we have platform technology. They can be used. Mm -hmm. They should be used proactively. Uh, we should be establishing partnerships with key stakeholders, with the regulators, with funding agencies, with NGOs, with governments in the developing world and here. Uh, in the developed world to, uh, to proactively, in a planned way, make vaccines and prepare them for the next pathogen. Uh, and industry can, of course, be a key player, but cannot be the decision maker. 
it cannot be us who decide, oh, maybe the next vaccine we should do is against MERS or against, uh, I think those are global decisions that a body like WHO or other and should be taken. Benita, can I ask you to uh, address something uh, that Monsef raised about uh, public-private partnership in providing us part of the solution here? Um, yeah, uh, one of the very interesting points that Monsef raised uh, was around the fact that actually we need new models. Um, Monsef, you also highlighted that epidemic uh, vaccine development has a lot of challenges and the lack of a market is one. The lack of um, a general global funding framework is another one. So what we've done at Sanofi Pasteur for our uh, Bengi vaccine um, is, is actually to scratch our heads and think that uh, we needed to flip the model, uh, really change the traditional vaccine introduction model and um, put it on its head. So as you know, um, typically uh, innovation is generally brought into developed markets that can um, afford the prices necessary to sustain innovation. But what we've done um, is that we have seen that uh, dengue has now um, increased and um, over the course of the last 20 years, um, dengue is now affecting half of the world's population. So we definitely thought that it would be important to develop and launch a vaccine to really um, alleviate the burden in endemic countries, which happen to be mostly middle income or lower um, income countries. So what we did was to um, again, uh, launch and develop this vaccine in countries like Mexico or the Philippines, where the burden of the disease is greatest. And to do so, we believe that it is important to invest into um, capacity that can um, provide quantity and quality of supply at launch, instead of at accepting the typical ramp-up delay that is for between five and ten years um, for innovation to be brought into lower and uh, lower middle-income countries. So the two other things that um, I believe are important to emphasize when we are looking for new models is that um, it is uh, somehow important to prioritize public sector programs so that most people in those countries can have access to the innovation and that industry also has a part to play probably in uh, balancing innovation with affordability. And again, for this dengue vaccine, we are working on new models um, to make sure that this is being feasible. So that's, that's um, some thoughts that I can offer in terms of trying to find new models. But again, I um, want to emphasize that um, for other epidemic um, vaccines, um, challenges very much remain. And uh, what GSK has done, uh, what we have done with Dengue, is not necessarily replicable from one disease to another. So everyone uh, will have to work together. And uh, I very much subscribe to the call for public-private partnerships, because that's probably the only way to move forward. And just to um, no, please, a, um, please. comment on that, I think, just to take that one step further, um, one of the lessons learned and one of the positive outcomes of Ebola was that you know, prior to this, we didn't really have a good framework or infrastructure or model for how to do these type of um, investigations and trials in emergencies, in times of crisis. And as an implementing agency, you know, that was a particular challenge, like how do we work with NIH, how do we work with GSK or Sanofi, and you know, in, in taking these and really doing the clinical trials and, and establishing the protocols and reporting the data and all of these things in the middle of the crisis. And I think now we have a precedent for that, um, which maybe we didn't have before, at least one where we've really put a lot of investment in making sure that it worked and having and getting positive results out of it. I mean, I think we were talking about vaccines, but there's recently the ZMAP as a therapeutic, the, the results of that trial. Um, you know, just came out, which was, you know, done very, very quickly under very difficult circumstances. And now we have a framework around which to build this. I um, mean, I think, even, though, even a lot of this in our session today, we've been talking about data. We now have the most clinical data on Ebola than we've ever had in the mm -hmm. past, and hopefully we'll ever have in the future. But what do we do with that? We, you know, we have a number of natural experiments that, that took place in terms of how International Medical Corps treated patients versus any other agency versus WHO versus Ministry of Health, and we can extract from there what is the standard of care, which wasn't defined before. It was all conjecture or anecdotal or based on, on clinical guidance. But, but now we have some hard evidence in which to look for, you know, really how do we address this as disease, and now we've built in the tools and the countermeasures and the therapeutics um, to deal with it as well. So I think, you know, that's one of the 
the silver linings that has come out of this that we can really take and, and utilize for a bull again because it'll happen again. Mm -hmm. It will happen in West Africa again. Um, and then, you know, and then from there, you know, for Zika or for the next virus or for um, pathogen, how do we deal with that as well? Michael, let me focus just a little bit on Zika. Um, you guys are the lead government agency uh, dealing with this issue. Um, what are you doing right now and what, what should people know about the disease? So I think, I, I think Tom, Tom Frieden sort of summarized it quite nicely. Uh, I was at, uh, several weeks ago, I was at a, a, a USAID Fogarty meeting on looking at Ebola, and the National Library of Medicine presented some interesting um, bibliographic data that prior to the uh, Ebola outbreak beginning in 2013, there had been a total of something like a little over 1,600 publications in the literature on Ebola. And prior to Zika being recognized as, a, as an outbreak in Brazil, um, prior to that in, in 2014, there had been a grand total of, I believe, 89 publications. That, that, was, that was all the world <laughs> had in terms of scientific literature on, on, on Zika virus. So there's a tremendous gap in just in terms of basic scientific information. Now, Zika is a flavivirus, and we actually have quite a bit of experience with other flaviviruses, dengue for which uh, Sanofi has in fact advanced a vaccine. Uh, yellow fever has also been, um, uh, has a, had a successful vaccine. So we have a track record in terms of operating in that general field, but obviously we have to fill in the unique features of, of Zika. Uh, so there's a fundamental aspect of basic science that really needs to be uh, uh, pushed very heavily. Uh, and having an established uh, uh, flavivirus community in terms of investigators is one that we're really uh, working with to, to expand that, that knowledge base. Uh, we've recognized that there are deficiencies um, in terms of our ability to respond to Zika in terms of diagnostics. So there's a lot of effort to try to develop better diagnostics, particularly that can distinguish Zika from dengue, which, mm -hmm. is, a, which is a critical issue. We know we can genetically, from the, from the, from the, DNA, from the RNA, of the virus tell the difference, but serologically, as Tom was saying, it's much, much harder to tell. So that's a major focus. And, and then in terms of uh, evaluating um, uh, uh, potential therapeutic interventions, although I think the vaccines, vaccines still remain foremost our, our greatest weapon to bring to bear, but, and there are a number of different vaccine efforts that are being brought to bear. Given what we know with some of the issues with other flaviviruses, however, and the potential for microcephaly, I think there will be a little bit of heightened concern about ensuring the safety of those interventions and the ability of them to effectively reduce whatever potential complications are definitively shown to be associated with Zika will be critical. So. Can I, can I sure, add? please. Because I think it's very important that we manage expectation and be very transparent in our uh, discussion. So in regards, for instance, because I, I really agree vaccine is, is the intervention uh, in, in this particular case with Zika that, that we need to advance the most quickly. I do think there will be vaccines tested in clinical trials in the next couple of years, as was said earlier today. But that's very different than having a vaccine that can be given to every adolescent girl mm -hmm. if, or, or mm -hmm. adolescent population uh, to prevent the uh, rare cases of microcephaly uh, uh, that, that are potentially associated with Zika. That takes a very different type of technology. It takes a major industrial player that is able to produce hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine to participate and to participate from day one because unless you use a technology that has embedded into it the capacity to be scaled up, you'll end up with a vaccine that you can make a nice publication you can do a small study, but you cannot impact public health. And for that to happen, it's going to take more than two years. We're going to need to go into large clinical trials. Unless, unless the community comes to the view that the risk is so big that we can take the risk to immunize millions or hundreds of millions of people before we learn on thousands and tens of thousands of people, which is, which is a lengthy process. So that's really important. And this is where. I come back to being proactive and being planned. It is essential if we want to do an, a vaccine in millions of doses rather than a publication, that we sit together 
and that we use technologies that have been proven to be industrializable, scalable, and safe. And frankly, the, the, the learning we had and the proposal we're putting forward is to say, you know what? GSK is ready to make available platform technologies that took us 30 years to develop and validate and billions to make. Make them available for the use for those vaccines against pathogens for which there's no market incentive, mm -hmm. but that can transform the world, population, economy, structure, society. We're prepared to do that, but we can't do it alone. Okay. We're asking for partnership. We have you know, extensive discussions with various governments uh, and with other industrial players and WHO and you know, all the stakeholders. Uh, and it's really very important that we move on because God knows what's the next letter of the alphabet after Ebola and Zika that we're going to be dealing with. Yeah. And building on these comments, um, I think that uh, it's very important as well to maintain consistency because what we've seen uh, with Ebola is once the, the threat um, recedes, so does the political resolving and the funding. And um, as, as it has been uh, highlighted by this panel, it takes years to actually um, develop the right technology and especially in terms of uh, developing new vaccines. So I, I think it is very important to make sure that there's no kind of an ebb and flow um, strategy to, to tackle those diseases and that um, indeed we can definitely change um, conventional model to introduce, to introduce innovation. We really want innovation to reach populations. We really want to develop uh, new technologies. It is important to make sure that the political will remains and that the funding can also be um, associated over the long term. And, and I guess that's why uh, the call for partnerships is also very important. And I, I'd like to, um, perhaps uh, since we're discussing a lot about West Africa, I'd like to remind everyone that there's this African proverb that says, um, when the music changes, so does the dance. And I believe that actually this year we have uh, the opportunity to change the dance for Africa, for emerging economies, and well, beyond. Um, since there's so much attention around Zika, but also around epidemics preparedness at general level. So maybe now is the year to really um, bring consistency in all these efforts and sustainability. Can I ask the, then a general question following on that? I know that in uh, Davos this year, pandemic and infectious diseases were a topic of discussion, including the launch of a major vaccine initiative. What impact can a coordinated collective response to these threats have in fighting the disease? So we were one of the instigators of the conversations mm -hmm. around vaccine <coughs> at Davos. And I think what we're trying to do and the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, the Norwegian government, uh, WHO, many other players have been instrumental in, in setting up what took place at Davos, what we're trying to do is to put around the same table the major vaccine industrial players. And A, raise the awareness of the role we have to play as an industry in society, which is far beyond the fact that we are a business. Uh, and actually, the same comment uh, holds true for antimicrobials. We hold technologies, knowledge, capabilities, experience, and expertise that is potentially critical for the world's safety and existence. And that's a responsibility that we need to be aware of and that we need to take very seriously and that we need to commit <coughs> excuse me, together to use them, to use that technology for the benefit of society, even when there is no business benefit, because it's just too big and too important. This is actually exactly how the antimicrobial consortia have been built. We estimate that it takes about 10 to 15 years to put together a team of experts knowledgeable enough to be able to discover novel antibiotics. If all the industry, which has been happening, most industrial players have left the field of antimicrobial because it's not a business where you can make a good return, and therefore this expertise gets lost. And unless we acted, the last three players that are still investing in antimicrobial drug discovery would also 
potentially active. And, and therefore, our capacity right. to discover a drug against a new bacteria that may come up would just disappear. Likewise, for vaccines, we have the capacities, the capabilities, the technologies to discover and make vaccines against pathogens that are on nobody's list until they become a disaster. Right. And vaccines should be there before. Let's, let's use them. We have some, Sanofi has some, Merck has some, Pfizer has some. There are five or six major players in the world. Uh, let's sit together and see how we can put those at work for society. That's what took place in Davos. There's been a very good traction for it. Uh, there is follow-up that's happening as we speak. And, and I think, I hope it will actually go beyond the words and into the practice. Uh, I think industry will be playing its role as it should, and society will be safer as it should. Yeah. Just to, oh, no, please, no, go ahead. I was going to say, just to build up that, and you had asked, I mean, the question you had asked was about having maximum impact and, you know, and, and things like this. And I think along with that, we also have to think about, and you had alluded to before, you can have all the vaccines that you want, or at least the technology. How do you really roll that out? How do you roll it out to scale? How do you roll it out in rural communities in Liberia or South yeah. Sudan or Central African Republic and things like this? And just to build on what Nia had said before, you know, parallel investments in health systems are really needed at the same time because if you don't have the ability to do campaigns, yeah. you know, to vaccinate the population, then we're, we're kind of back at uh, square one. You know, Liberia has one physician for every 100,000 people. Mm. We, have, in this country, have 250. Like, these are apples and oranges. We're not talking about the same thing here. And so I mean, we need an investment in workforce, mm -hmm. in supply chain, mm -hmm. in training and education, in, in kind of um, reach into vulnerable communities, um, into risk mapping, and then, and then paying attention to those risks. At the same time, so we can take these technologies take them to scale and really deliver them to the, the people in the communities who need them most. So it's, it's, it can't be an either or, right? It has to happen in parallel and it has to happen con um, concurrently if we're really going to have the maximum impact of, of all the research dollars and the investment being put at this level and really seeing that impact on the ground. Michael, can I ask, uh, tell me a little bit about these issues in the con context of pandemic flu and what the unique challenges are there? Is that well, flu, I think, is, is, is a recognized threat, and I think this is, this is one important point to emphasize, that, that we, can, we, we clearly need to be prepared for the next pandemic or public health infectious disease outbreak. Uh, I think exactly what the next threat will be, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit uh, 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 nebulous in order to predict. I think it's quite uh, subjective in terms of the, the analysis. We've seen some movement recently with the WHO meeting uh, 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 late last year on coming up with, for want of a better term, I call pandemic wannabes of things that we might, everyone can agree we should be worried about. But at the same time, we can't, we can't ignore the fact that there are a lot of things we know quite well are in fact very critical threats and flu happens to fall in that class where, as was, was highlighted earlier, um, uh, I think by, by, by Tom Frieden, is that there's clearly hundreds of thousands of people dying annually of flu. We know it comes back every year. Uh, and the concern is of a 1918 style uh, strain that, that could yield uh, uh, millions and potentially tens or even hundreds of millions of deaths. And so the approach, the, the approach there is to move beyond our current uh, a paradigm of, of adjusting the strain from year to year and trying to develop a universal approach. Uh, successful application of that in the flu arena, I think, will encourage people to look at those types of concepts that yield the universal or strain-independent immunity to perhaps other classes. Uh, coronavirus would be one. Flavy might be another one that we would want to take a look at. But we may be thinking more, much more generically in terms of applying applying those types of concepts more broadly to have much more comprehensive overall prevention strategies. But I think flu is, is something that is a real and present danger. We know it's going to come. We know it's going to come every year. And we need to, we need to be always prepared for that. So we can't lose sight of the known threats that we have in front of us, uh, preparing for something that may or may not happen. And we need to do both. And we need to, be, we need to balance our resources appropriately to be responding to, to them. 
uh, with the recognition that I don't think we can, we don't have the technology at this point, I believe, to stop an outbreak from occurring. What we need to do is be able to recognize it as quickly as possible and be prepared in order to respond as quickly as possible. And I, yep. sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Just, just quickly building on that, I, I um, wanted to emphasize that um, for all the various diseases that you've emphasized, surveillance is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps this is something that we've not mentioned so far, but it would be very important to continue investing in surveillance as also we, you've mentioned, continue investing in um, developing vaccines, technologies um, for these diseases. So yeah, and just one short additional comment. I think in addition to that, I think recognition that if we address the known threats that we have and we reduce the background mm -hmm. of infectious disease okay. in the population, it actually makes it much easier to recognize okay. when something new is actually yep. upon us uh, because we don't have as much nonspecific illness going around. So on, on, the, on the blueprint, then, just to give how formidable the challenge is, the world capacity, every manufacturer, world's capacity for flu vaccines is 600 million doses for one year. When, in 2008, the flu pandemic came, one of the biggest problems, and GSK was one of the companies, and I'll describe to you how platform technology can play a big role, was one of the companies that committed, let everything go, and made hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine. One of the biggest challenges was who was going to get this vaccine. And I can tell you we had prime ministers and heads of states calling and said, I'm going to. And if the manufacturing site was in Germany, the German government says we're going to send the military, we're going to take the doses we need. You're not going to send them elsewhere. So we need to find for flu, and, and the U.S. has a very advanced program led by BARDA, we need to find ways to identify a strain, design a vaccine, produce it into hundreds of millions, if not billions of doses in a matter of months. And probably, if, if there is a real pandemic in months, there would be probably a few tens of millions of deaths, if not more. That's what we're talking about. Potentially talking about building manufacturing sites, which is happening in the US, that would be almost idle until there is a flu pandemic. And what kind of technology and how do you make it work? So in terms of platform technologies, it so happened we had a platform technology called an adjuvant that enhances the effectiveness of a vaccine. And it allowed us to cut in five the dose of the flu antigen that you get to immunize, which meant we multiplied by five the amount of flu vaccine we could produce. Uh, and, and there may be other technologies that can help and make more feasible our response to this threat. But, and, and just to close here, I mean, the challenge with flu is its mode of transmission, right? There are many other pathogens that are transmitted in the air. And uh, you know, we need to be careful. We need, I don't want to be catastrophic here, but <laughs> we, need, we, need, we need to understand the challenges, manage our expectations, invest proactively right. in making vaccines against those pathogens we know are able to be transmitted through aerosol, because we know they can be just transmitted. Can, can I, I, we're going to need to, to wrap up. I wanted to ask just a broad communications question for people to respond briefly to. Um, but how do we change people's perception that these diseases are not other people's problem, that they're everybody's problems? That seems to be the basis for political will when it comes to all of these issues. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, um, and I think you alluded to it actually in um, your talk at lunch, is that we know that uh, in this today's society, in this world today, that a, a threat anywhere is a threat everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we saw it obviously firsthand with Ebola. We're seeing it now with Zika. Um, and so I think, unfortunately, the way we've learned this is through actual trial and error and actual events, you know. But and I think we need to take these opportunities and really galvanize around the messaging here to say like, well, you know, if we're going to protect the US, the health of the US, we need to attack these diseases in the most fragile states on earth because these are where these things come up and they're amplified and then we are just a plane ride away from anywhere. Um, so I think really looking at the lessons learned over the past two years and the outcomes and the fact that Ebola, you know, West Africa, but we 
in Nigeria, in Senegal, in Mali, in Spain, in the U.S., that, it, that we're all at risk if the we UK. don't take collective action in the U.K. Um, we're all at risk if we don't take collective action around addressing these at its source. And that goes back to what you said before in terms of health systems. You know, the best health system to respond to an emergency is one that works every day and is then taken to yeah. scale. Um, and so, you know, really we need to build from the ground up here. And that's where a lot of the parallel investments, I think, should lie to really use these technologies to their best effect. I think that may be a good place to end the discussion. <laughs> I think that was a really good summary of, of where we are. I want to thank all of our panelists for an enlightening and a little bit disturbing discussion um, and uh, for all that you do for the health of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us in the main ballroom for the closing talk with Barbara Bush, Resilience in Global Health Leadership.